Welcome everyone to another very timely and very topical IMET webinar. On January 20th, in a, approximately six and a half weeks, there'll be a changing of the guard in the White House. Um, we already know some of the, the faces of the um, newly appointed Biden cabinet um, who had worked in the Obama administration. Um, and we already know that there is going to be enormous pressure on Israel to cede land for a Palestinian state. And that President-elect Joe Biden um, really would like to return to the JCPOA, the fatally flawed Iranian nuclear deal. How are the Israelis going to handle a new Biden administration? We at AMET believe, as the philosopher George Santayana said, he who does not study history is condemned to repeat its mistakes. One way of navigating what might um, happen is to take a look at the history of Israeli diplomacy. Um, and I can think of no one more preeminently qualified than Dr. Emmanuel Navon. Emmanuel is an international relations expert um, and he lectures at Tel Aviv University and at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya as well as at Israel's Military Academy. He is a fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and at the Kohelet um, Policy Forum. And he's a foreign affairs analyst for an Israeli-based news TV channel. He's an expert on Israel's foreign policy, and he has published dozens of articles and three books, including From Israel with Hope, um, Why and How Israel Will Continue to Thrive, and the victory of Zionism, reclaiming the narrative about Israel's domestic, regional, and international challenges. And Emmanuel has just published a fourth book, which I am eager to read, The Star and the Scepter, which got rave reviews so far. And I should also um, say that um, Emmanuel is um, a member of a Mets advisory board. Um, so Emmanuel, Tell us briefly what the premise of your book is all about, um, and um, if you could just refresh our memories about high points in Israel's diplomatic history. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, and it's a pleasure for me uh, to be here, to be uh, hosted by uh, Emet. Uh, as you mentioned, I've uh, been a member of the board for, of Emet since the very inception. If you remember a few uh, years ago, I don't even remember how long ago, it was like almost two decades ago, I think, when right. I was in Washington and first right. met, so that, right. you know, right. like, goes back a while, and uh, it was, if you remember, at the beginning of the uh, second intifada, right. uh, when the situation was very tough here in Israel, so thank goodness, the situation is much better today in Israel, but uh, we still need to keep our uh, historical perspective, which is what I've been trying to do in my uh, new book, The Star and the Scepter, a diplomatic uh, history of Israel. I, I wrote this book because after teaching a class on Israel's foreign policy for many years at Tel Aviv University and at the IDC Herzliya, I came to realize that uh, there was in fact no book, no comprehensive book on Israel's foreign policy uh, explaining Israel's foreign policy uh, under all its aspects, but also with a wide historical perspective. Because when I started writing the book, uh, I said, well, the, the history of the Jewish people did not start in 1948, so when do you start? So I guess 3,000 years ago, which obviously is very ambitious, but I do believe uh, that in order to understand uh, the achievements and the challenges that Israel faces in the international arena today, you really need to have this wide uh, historical uh, perspective. And especially when it comes to the uh, relation between the U.S. Uh, and Israel. Here also, if we want to know what to expect from the upcoming administration, and if we want to know how to handle it, we need this historical perspective. And when it comes to the relation with the United States, we tend to take for granted that this uh, strategic relation we have today uh, always existed, but that is not the case. Uh, President Roosevelt, when he came back from the Yalta Conference and he met the Saudi king on his way back to Washington, said, quote, I learned more about the Middle East in one hour with the king than in all previous years. He had committed in this meeting in preventing the partition of the British mandate and preventing the establishment of a Jewish state. 
he had agreed with the king of Saudi Arabia that there would be a deal with the United States whereby the U.S. will safeguard the security of the Saudi kingdom and the Saudi kingdom would, would guarantee the supply of oil to the American economy. All the lobbies, the oil lobbies in Washington, was strongly opposed to uh, the establishment of Israel. So was the establishment in Washington, the State Department, the Department of Defense. They all thought that a U.S. support for a Jewish state uh, would hurt U.S. interest in the Middle East and also encourage Soviet influence in the region. Had it not been for Harry Truman, who uh, of course replaced Roosevelt after his death, uh, the United States would not have supported the uh, independence of Israel. In fact, Harry Truman wrote in his memoir how he took his personal decision against the advice of Secretary of State George Marshall. In fact, George Marshall said to Truman, Mr. President, they stole this land. They don't deserve a state. I quote this in my book. If you vote for recognition, I will never vote for you again. So Truman made a courageous decision, but he made the decision against the stance and opinion of all the establishment in Washington, including his Secretary of State. And when the, um, when the Eisenhower administration was sworn in 1952, Eisenhower and his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, came with this attitude of, well, Truman just went too far in supporting the Jewish state. And by doing that, by the way, it wasn't even true because he did vote in favor of partition at the UN and he did recognize Israel, but there was still an armed, a U.S. armed embargo uh, on Israel. Let's not forget that. And Harry Truman, I mean, uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles thought that the, the recognition by Truman basically uh, pushed the Arab states in the arms of the Soviet Union. And they went out of their way uh, to distance themselves from Israel. Uh, one of the first trips of uh, Foster Dulles, of Secretary of State Foster Dulles, was to the Middle East and to Egypt saying, we are not Truman, we're going to have a much more balanced attitude to the Middle East. And they did. I mean, they, they really, their policy was really, uh, was really anti-Israeli. I mean, when, when it came, you know, when, when there was a vote at the Security Council in 1953, uh, brought by Syria because Israel was doing some uh, some work in the area on the northern side of the uh, Lake uh, um, Tiberias, uh, the Sea of, of, of Galilee, and uh, the United States voted against Israel and supported the Syrian position that Israel was not allowed uh, to do this uh, infrastructure work. And then, of course, when uh, the Soviet Union signed an alliance with Egypt in 1955, supplying it with weapons uh, via Czechoslovakia. Israel's prime minister at the time called Eisenhower saying, you see, now Egypt is an ally of the Soviet Union. Take us. And Eisenhower basically said, no, thank you, but no thanks, because I don't want, by doing that, uh, to, I, would be, I would basically be pushing Arab states into the arms of the Soviet Union. Stay away from me. And so that's why, you know, because he refused to uh, sell weapons to Israel, despite the military alliance between the Soviet Union and Egypt, that Israel ended up having an alliance with France and going to war because when Nasser, you know, nationalized the Suez Canal, basically stealing it from Britain and France, he did it because he had the backing of the Soviet Union. And Eisenhower went out of his way to demand from his Western allies and from Israel to get out of there immediately even though he didn't lift a finger against the Russians in Budapest who send the tanks in Budapest that same year. And so if, is, if Eisenhower had provided weapons to Israel in 1955 after the, the alliance between Egypt and the Soviet Union, Israel would not have had to go to war together with France against Egypt in 1956. Now, at the end of the day, this policy of the Eisenhower administration fell because more and more Arab countries did join the Soviet Union. It was the case of Egypt in 1955. It was the case of Syria a year later, and then Iraq in 1958. And it's only under the Kennedy administration that the United States started reconsidering its policy in the Middle East, ceased to consider Israel a liability, and started looking at it as a potential, I, I insist, a potential ally. And it is only under President Johnson, when the Middle East was becoming more and more pro-Soviet under the leadership of the Egyptian President Nasser, that Johnson for the first time started agreeing to sell weapons to Israel and Israel progressively switched its alliance from France to the, uh, to the United States. 
Uh, and of course, with the um, victory of the Israel in the Six Day War, uh, the the uh, value of Israel as an ally was proved beyond any doubt because Israel humiliated the, the Soviet Union and this didn't cost a single dollar or a soldier to the United States. On the other hand, the United States found itself being the ally of a country that held territories that it had conquered during the war and the United States became under huge pressure to pressure Israel to withdraw from those territories in order to reach a deal with the Arab world. And this became even more so after the Yom Kippur War and the oil embargo, where that, with the oil embargo, the US was under huge pressure uh, to convince Israel to withdraw from territories to reach agreements with uh, the Arab states. And this, of course, is what happened after the Yom Kippur War, when in 1975, uh, Secretary of State uh, Kissinger basically forced the first Rabin government to withdraw from 20% of the Sinai Peninsula uh, just for another uh, armistice agreement with Egypt. And when Itzhak Rabin refused, saying, well, what do we get in exchange? Uh, what Kissinger wanted was to, wanted to prove to Sadat that America could deliver Israel. Sadat realized after the Yom Kippur War that he was not going to recover Sinai via war in the Soviet Union and only the U.S. could deliver Israel. And so President Ford at the time, who had replaced Nixon after Nixon had resigned because of the Watergate, basically threatened Rabin and said, if you don't sign, I will reassess relations with Israel. And so Israel was forced into signing this agreement. Eventually, this led to the Camp David Agreement in 1979. Uh, but eventually, of course, uh, in recent years, uh, there was this belief uh, under uh, the, uh, the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, the first Bush administration, of course, uh, that uh, uh, Israeli withdrawals from territories would lead to peace also with the Palestinians. But we know that the big difference, we know today that the big difference is, of course, that Egypt wanted the Sinai Peninsula. The Palestinians want all of what they call Palestine. As a matter of fact, the PLO is called the Palestine Liberation Organization. It's not called the West Bank and Gaza Liberation Organization. It was created in 1964, three years before the Six Day War. Uh, and despite that, most US administrations believed that by reaching a deal on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, we would be done. This was proved to be a mistake at the Camp David Conference in the summer of 2000. Uh, and yet, most US administrations have been repeating the same mistake over and over again, despite, uh, despite the precedent of the Camp David uh, conference. Uh, that was the case, of course, also uh, under the second Bush administration. I mean, the, the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, who was in fact the first president to talk about a Palestinian state uh, in his, uh, in his uh, 2002 speech uh, in the White House, uh, and the uh, Obama administration and uh, the efforts of John Kerry to reach a deal. And by the way, and I'll, I'll finish with that and I'll take your questions. Um, in, in, the, in the deal brokered by John Kerry in 2014, uh, basically uh, what Kerry obtained from Netanyahu uh, and, and, from, and, and from these negotiations was basically a return of Israel to the 67 lines with minor uh, uh, land swaps, uh, some kind of a gesture on the refugees and also a gesture on Jerusalem. And, and Abbas said no to that, which is fairly amazing. I mean, Susan Rice, uh, yell at, uh, at, at uh, uh, Saib Arikat saying, you guys must be complete idiots if you're going to reject that deal. And President Obama was completely frustrated with Mahmoud Abbas. And yet, and yet, uh, it is Israel that was punished for the failure of those talks. How? Uh, by the fact that in December 2016, in the last months of the Obama administration, uh, the Obama administration did not veto uh, UN Security Resolution 2334. Uh, which is a huge problem for Israel because basically that resolution rejects any legality and legitimacy to any Israeli presence beyond the Green Line, uh, which is not what had been achieved in 67 with Resolution 242. UN Security Res uh, Council Resolution 242 is very flexible on the issue of borders. Uh, it leaves it open to negotiations. It is not the case of 2334. And that resolution is a very, very big problem. Last point, uh, even in the uh, deal of the century of President Trump, 
uh, don't forget that, of course, this deal of the century is no longer relevant now, but it was designed to be uh, in conformity with 2334Y, because if you look at it at the end of the day, in the deal of the century, there's no, nearly no net territorial gain for Israel, because there are land swaps between the land that Israel was supposed to annex in Judea and Samaria, and the land that was supposed to be annexed to a Palestinian state deep inside Israel in the Negev Desert and in the, and in the southern Judean Desert. So 2334 says, we don't agree to any change to the, line, to the armistice lines of 1949 unless otherwise agreed between the sides, which means that you could have a land swap. The land swaps proposed by the Trump plan are just bigger than the one that had been agreed in the past under John Kerry. And that's the only real difference. Of course, that the Palestinian state and the Trump plan had to meet a criteria that were never going to be met and had to be demilitarized. But again, don't forget that uh, President George W. Bush also in his June 2002 speech on the Middle East had conditioned the establishment of a Palestinian state by complete democratization of Palestinian society and by Arafat fighting terrorism. That condition of Arafat fighting terrorism was basically identical to uh, asking Al Capone to fight the mafia. And therefore, also there, the condition uh, was never going to be uh, met. So to conclude, what should, be, what should we accept, expect today? Uh, and how should we handle ourselves with the upcoming administration? So I think that on the one hand, uh, when you look at the appointments of Joe Biden in his upcoming administration, uh, the people he has, he has so far appointed when it comes to foreign policy in the Middle East are definitely not uh, radicals. I mean, there are people who I think are mostly moderate and, um, and have a balanced approach. On the other hand, Biden has made it very clear that he wants to reopen negotiations on the JCPOA. And already the Iranians are telling him, you know, uh, we're not going to renegotiate. Uh, we, we're not going to talk about missiles and supporting our militias throughout the Middle East. So I, I really hope, I really hope that the Biden administration has learned the mistakes that were made under the Obama administration, uh, that they really are going to behave like a superpower and not beg for an agreement uh, with a regime that is on its knees uh, economically, and that the achievements of the past few months of normalization with the Sunni states and hopefully Saudi Arabia these achievements are going to be maintained. Uh, but for this to happen, I think that the, 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 the Biden administration really has to be uh, to show Iran uh, who is the boss here, who is the superpower. And that, of course, is related to how the Biden administration is going to be handling China, because uh, you know China is a major player, of course, in the JCPOA. And, uh, and whether or not China is willing to play ball and, uh, and try to uh, push Iran to renegotiate will be critical. Uh, and that, of course, and that's where everything is related. Everything is related. Uh, ha however, the Obama, the uh, uh, Biden administration handles China will have an impact on how China is going to, uh, uh, to re relate to the negotiations between the United States and Iran. So I'll leave it here for now. Uh, and uh, I left, of course, enough time for questions. Sarah, if you have questions, maybe we'll op open it to come some kind of a Discussion. Sure. Wonderful. Okay. A, a beautiful and extremely concise, um, wonderful history of the diplomacy between Israel and the United States. Do you see a pattern where um, the incoming presidents try to undo the mistakes, the, the perceived mistakes of the former one, and they're going out into a whole different direction? So yes, the answer is yes. And um, as I said, for example, if you look at the Eisenhower administration in 1953, they were like, you know, we're not going to, uh, to be like so pro-Israel as, as Truman. And they really went into the other direction. Same thing with Kennedy who said, well, we're going to get closer to Israel. You had this pattern every, every, after each new administration of uh, changing policy towards Israel for better or worse. Uh, and I think that, um, what we've seen also in the past uh, uh, in the past few years is also an attempt to really undo what previous administrations did. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not always possible to undo what was done before. Because if you take, for example, I mentioned Resolution 2334, it was passed by the Security Council. 
it cannot be undone by uh, the administration. That, that's the whole problem with it. It was already passed as a United Nations Con uh, Security Council uh, resolution. And um, so, so I, I expect that here also the new administration will go out of its way to say we're not Trump, uh, even though uh, uh, Joe Biden already said that he will, no, he will not reverse the decision, for example, to transfer the U.S. Embassy to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, unfortunately, he might uh, very much, uh, very like, likely renew the funding on UNRWA. And that is a big problem because, and here I think there's a lot of work for an organization like yours in Washington to explain that UNRWA is not humanitarian aid. You know, people have to stop thinking that UNRWA is about humanitarian, it is not. It is about uh, pursuing, uh, it is about funding what is a major obstacle to peace in the Middle East. It's about funding the illusion, uh, which is completely baseless in, in international law, that after three or four generations, the descendants of um, displaced persons and refugees from 1948 should be entitled to live and, uh, in, in Jaffa and in Haifa and become citizens of Israel. This is completely absurd. And that is exactly what UNRWA is about. Uh, UNRWA is about what, uh, uh, what Congresswoman Clive tweeted, retweeted two days ago uh, uh, from, uh, you know, from the, from the uh, Jordan to the sea, Palestine shall be free. That is what UNRWA is about. And that is what has to be explained to the new administration to Congress, it is not a humanitarian organization. It's an organization that makes it impossible to solve uh, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict by nurturing the, uh, the illusion and the lie uh, that there is a right in international law for descendants of descendants of descendants to become citizen of a country where they never lived and where they were not born. And that, I think, is the next challenge. Right, right. Yes, um, we've got a lot of work that's um, cut out for us. We have to fasten our seatbelts. It's going to be a rocky ride. Um, in your opinion, when were diplomatic relations between Israel and the United States at an all-time high? I would say, um, the uh, first of all, under the Trump administration, definitely, was the, uh, as I said, the uh, uh, the defunding of UNRWA, the, uh, the transferring of the embassy to Jerusalem, the recognizing Israel's sovereignty over the Golden Heights, this is really unprecedented. Uh, there were highs also uh, under, uh, under President Bush, uh, President W. Bush, of course, not the father, the son, um, because even though his approach to the conflict was very problematic and he didn't make a lot of mistakes, he did write this letter to Ariel Sharon in 2004, which was significant in saying uh, openly for the first time for a US president uh, and putting it in writing that obviously Israel's uh, future border should not be identical to the former armistice lines of 1949 and thereby recognizing the fact that reality on the ground should, have been, should be taken into account in future negotiations. And that also was a very important, uh, a very important achievement. I think also under President Reagan, uh, there was a very good relationship in many ways. But on the other hand, uh, don't forget that President Reagan is also the first one who started negotiations with the PLO uh, in uh, 1988, uh, by the end of his administration. Uh, and so, and, and also, it's also an administration that sold uh, uh, you know, fighter jets to Saudi Arabia, and back then Saudi Arabia was an enemy state of Israel and not a de facto ally just like today. So um, there have been many presidents who were uh, very favorable to Israel. Uh, I mean, President Truman, I mentioned before, uh, President Kennedy uh, kind of uh, uh, corrected the policy of his predecessor. Uh, President Reagan, despite the fact that, as I said, uh, he sold those uh, fighter jets to Saudi Arabia and uh, started the uh, dialogue uh, with the PLO. And uh, President George W. Bush, who, uh, as I said, with his letter to Ariel Sharon, officially stated that the United States did not expect Israel to return to the uh, 49 Armistice Line, so, a letter, by the way, that was not endorsed and recognized by the uh, Obama administration. But I think what we've seen in the past four years uh, is really uh, unprecedented. 
uh, especially, I think, the uh, transfer of the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, according to uh, U.S. law, by the way. This, uh, yes. uh, you know, at the end of the day, President Trump uh, just uh, uh, applied the law and, and, and obeyed the law. Uh, right. But his gesture is something that I, I think will be remembered for, for many generations uh, in Israel and, and throughout the diaspora. So, um, under which administration do you think the relations were at an all-time low? So, I would say uh, the Carter administration and, uh, and the, uh, the Eisenhower, I mean, I would say Eisenhower, Carter, and Obama. Even though with Obama, he did upgrade the uh, security relation with Israel, the military relation with Israel uh, was very much upgraded. But, on the other hand, as I said, the... Um, the, uh, the non-vetoing of the resolution at the UN at the end of his second term uh, is something that uh, left a scar uh, on Israel's uh, international and regional standing. Because now, even though currently the whole idea of negotiation with the Palestinians is not relevant, but it, it, it established a precedent that will be nearly impossible uh, to undo. And under President Carter, I mean, we know what happened also to Carter uh, later on in his life uh, when it comes to his attitude to Israel. Uh, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I mean, uh, Carter on the one hand did play a role in uh, brokering the agreement between Israel and Egypt in, in 1979. Uh, but on the other hand, he was also the first uh, uh, American president who openly called upon uh, Israel to negotiate with the PLO. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, a year after the signature of the uh, Camp David Agreement in 1979, uh, Carter actually joined uh, the decision of the European Economic Community in Venice in 1980 uh, to bring in the PLO and to ask Israel to negotiate with the PLO. Uh, so already back then, even as president, uh, he and, 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 and you know, later on in the recent years, he's also been in touch with, with Hamas leaders. Uh, the relation with him was, was uh, extremely, extremely problematic, but also you know, things are also very, it's really a black and white issue. I mean, even, even if you look at the relation under George Bush, the father, right? So um, he's the one, you know, if you remember, I mean, you probably remember it, uh, in uh, the, uh, the, the crisis, the diplomatic crisis uh, of the, uh, when Israel asked for a loan guarantee mm -hmm. uh, and, and to, integ to uh, integrate the immigrants from the Soviet Union, and he refused to sign it. Uh, because uh, Shamir, Prime Minister Shamir, would not commit not to use any of that money to build uh, in Judea and Samaria. And that was a serious uh, diplomatic crisis. On the other hand, President Bush was also very involved to help bringing the, uh, uh, the Ethiopian Jews to Israel and helping the Aliyah of the Russian Jews. So, you know, there were good things and bad things. So, to what degree do you believe that personal chemistry between the leaders of the two nations um, influences diplomacy? I think that the bottom line is always interest. I mean, the uh, interest is always the guiding principle of foreign policy. But if on top of interest you have a good chemistry, that definitely, definitely helps. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the case between uh, President Clinton and Itzhak Rabin, uh, they had a very good uh, relation, they had a very good chemistry between them. I think it was also the case uh, between uh, George W. Bush and, uh, and Eud Olmer. Uh, they also had a very good relation. Uh, and I think also between Netanyahu and, um, and Trump. Uh, I think that the fact that there was such a bad blood between Obama and Netanyahu is probably one of the reasons why Obama did not veto 2334. I think if there had been a relation of trust, um, this could have been avoided. Uh, I think that seriously, the, the, the 2334, if Obama had trusted Netanyahu, if, uh, if there had been a mutual respect between the two, uh, he would not have done that. And, and here you see an example of how a, a, a bad relation and, and a badly managed relation between leaders can have sometimes uh, uh, terrible consequences. Uh, and uh, I, th I think Nixon and Golda had a good relation also in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is this, uh, I actually tell this anecdote in my book that Nixon once said to Golda Meir, uh, when after you appointed Kissinger as Secretary of State, 
uh, at the time uh, Golda Meir's foreign minister was Abba Ibn. And Nixon said to Golda, I say, you know, we both have a uh, Jewish foreign minister. And Golda said to him, yes, but mine speaks English without an accent. <laughs> That's adorable. That's adorable. Uh, so um, speaking of Golda, um, Israel has um, a very uncanny, interesting relationship with um, Russian President Vladimir Putin. I know that um, under most circumstances, um, Putin has given the green light for Israel to strike out at Hezbollah in um, Syria um, on their way to Lebanon. And um, they seem to have some kind of an understanding. Could you describe that relationship? So my book also deals at length with the relation, the very complex relation between Israel and Russia. Let's put it this way. Uh, the bottom line is that Russian and Israeli interests clash everywhere in the Middle East. <laughs> it's very clear. Uh, we do not have the same interests. Russia supports the nuclear deal with Iran. Uh, Russia has an economic interest in bringing back Iran in the uh, energy market because for years they've been trying to build a, uh, a cartel of natural gas, a kind of OPEC of natural gas with Iran and Qatar to try and slow down the uh, lowering of prices due to the huge production of natural gas by the United States through the shell uh, industry. Uh, and that's why he supports also uh, the Assad family in, in uh, Syria. Don't forget that Russia provided most of the nuclear technology to Iran. So our interests very clearly clash in the Middle East. This, this being said, on the other hand, Putin uh, is also a realist. Mm -hmm. And he knows that Israel is uh, the uh, biggest military power of the Middle East. Israel is the great power of the Middle East. And, and Israel cannot be ignored when it comes to uh, Syria. And in a way, it does work for Putin that Israel is doing the work in Syria of eliminating uh, Iran's encroachment of that country, or what is left of that country, because this way he doesn't have to do it. Don't forget that Putin did not get involved in uh, Syria in order to deliver that country to the Iranians. So he does not oppose Israel's actions there. He respects Israel. He respects Netanyahu. And, and that enables us to have this this uh, dialogue with him, despite the fact that we both understand that we have clashing interests in the Middle East, but we also have a common interest in coordinating our moves uh, when it comes to Syria. Another thing with Putin also is that, and, and many articles and books have been written about this, that he happens to be, which is very unlikely for a Russian leader, a uh, philo-Semite. Hmm. Uh, and when a couple of years ago, by the way, there was this, uh, Russian plan that was uh, put down uh, the the whole in the skies of Syria the whole establishment in Moscow I mean the, the defense establishment was very much in favor of uh, really uh, taking action against Israel and he personally stopped it uh, Putin uh, is not a um, certainly not a democratic leader uh, he's not um, uh, you know he, he, he's a really tough guy. He's not a Democrat and he's, he's very cynical. But for Israel, he happens to be an asset because of his attitude to Israel, because of the fact that he happens to be, uh, he happens to admire Israel. He happens not to be an anti-Semite as opposed to uh, uh, what is generally the case among Russian leaders. And, and as far as Israel is concerned, uh, he really is an asset. Don't forget, and two years ago, or three years ago, uh, the uh, a guest of honor to uh, celebrate uh, the anniversary of the victory of Russia in the Second World War was the Israeli Prime Minister, and you had the Russian army playing at Tikva on the Red Square. I mean, this was would have been unthinkable in the past. So, as I said, bottom line is we our interests clash in the Middle East, but he has respect for us. He knows that. Uh, Israel is, is, is a great power and that things needs, need to be coordinated between Moscow and Jerusalem. Yes, also, um, we, we, we've been noticing how Israel is um, allowing the Chinese to um, take um, a hold of the port in Haifa. Um, and uh, could you describe this kind of relationship between Red China and Israel right now? 
So with China, and I explained this in my book also, it took many, many years to finally establish a relation that was impossible during the Cold War. Uh, and uh, starting in the mid, late 70s, uh, secret ties started taking place between Israel and China, especially the military ties. Uh, and eventually, China and Israel established full diplomatic relations in, uh, uh, in 1992. Uh, thanks to those military ties that were secretly established in the late 1970s, mostly because uh, China uh, and, and the Soviet Union uh, were clashing since the uh, late 50s and many other reasons. But eventually the U.S. Uh, put a stop to that military relation. Uh, in 2000, we had to cancel uh, a, a deal with China. Uh, they got very upset about it. In 2004, the United States government make, make us sign a, uh, an agreement that we would basically stop uh, selling uh, military uh, technology uh, to the Chinese. So since then, instead of the military, we've been having a very fruitful uh, uh, trade relationship and uh, investments in technology. The Chinese are very interested in Israeli technology and infrastructure, and we are on the map of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Uh, and we are on that map, not because of our uh, location in the Middle East, but also because of our technology. Uh, but here, of course, with the, uh, the trade war and uh, the uh, controversy around uh, Huawei and the fact that today the U.S., especially in the past four years, uh, considered China to be, uh, to be a, 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 a competitor. Uh, so the U.S. government in recent years has been putting pressure on Israel uh, even in the civilian area to tone down Chinese investment, to cut down uh, Chinese investments in Israel. Uh, and here, that's, that's a big dilemma for Israel because our economic relation with China is very profitable uh, when it comes to the investments here. Uh, but at the end of the day, of course, our relation with the United States is more, uh, is more important. And, uh, and that will be part, I think, also of uh, what will have to be discussed with the uh, Biden administration what will be their policy vis-a-vis -vis China? Um, will they try to build some kind of a coalition uh, of like-minded governments of allies? Will that include Israel? Will Biden try to build a coalition uh, to face China together with European countries, but also Australia, Japan? Will Israel be part of it? We'll have to see. But, but what, is, what is for sure is that even though Chinese investments in Israel have been very profitable, We've had to cut them down, and we can no longer ignore the fact that the U.S. today considers China uh, to be a competitor and even a threat, and that the United States is our closest ally. Right. right. And if you're going to be dealing with China at all, watch out for your intellectual property. I don't Absolutely. think they respect that. Right? <laughs> so um, one final question, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, it's an interesting title, The Star and the Scepter. How did you arrive at that title? What's so I arrived at the title. As you know, I, I decided for this book to, uh, it's very ambitious to write a 3,000 uh, history of the Jewish diplomatic history. And I, I decided to go back to the Bible and, uh, and uh, you know, to reread the whole Hebrew Bible and, and to look into Israel and the nations in the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got stuck by a, a, a verse in the book of Numbers where it says, uh, quote, a star rises from Jacob, a scepter comes forth from Israel. And my understanding of that verse is that, um, uh, well, that verse was pronounced by the, the prophet or the sorcerer Bilam, who was literally hired by King Balak to curse the Jewish people and ended up actually blessing us. And what's interesting in this verse is that what does it mean a star rises from Jacob and a scepter from Israel. So my understanding of that is that the name, Jacob had his name changed to Israel after he fought during the night this angel. And basically the, the story, to make a long story short, it says that, you know, Jacob and Esau, and Esau, Esau were twin brothers. But Esau was all about you know, material strength, physical strength and materiality, and, and Jacob was all, only about spirituality. Mm -hmm. And neither of them could really inherit the spiritual inheritance of 
Avram and Yitzchak. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's why, that's why uh, Jacob had to fight physically in the real world, because one, one was, if you like, so to speak, uh, from Athens and one from Sparta. And so, and Jacob had to be a little bit of a Spartan, and it's only after he, he proved his ability and willingness to fight in the real world that he was given the name Israel, Israel, which means God's fighter. Mm -hmm. And yet, and yet, uh, the name, the, the Bible keeps using this name to Israel and Jacob, even though, even after he received his new name, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as, as opposed, by the way, to once Abraham becomes Abraham, that's it. We don't say mm -hmm. Abraham again. Right. Once Sarai becomes Sarah, that's it. We don't talk about Sarai anymore. But in the case of Jacob and Israel, it keeps going back and forth, sometimes in the same verse. Why? And that's what I claim, is that he actually never completely internalized the fact that he had become Israel and he had to, to, to fight in the real world. So the star symbolizes in Jewish history, spirituality. Uh, it's Jacob being the man of the tents and, and the intellectual, the Athenian. And the scepter is the symbol of power and political strength. And my central thesis in this book, after going through, through 3,000 years of diplomatic history, is that the Jewish people has been successful in the past and will continue to be successful, successful in the future by always keeping a delicate balance between the two, between the star and the scepter. Not only going for spirituality, you know, all the Jewish German philosophers who were against Zionism saying, you know, we, we found our spiritual motherland in Germany uh, mm -hmm. and we know what happened after that. Or, on the other hand, the completely anti-religious and materialistic Zionists who didn't want to hear about anything to do with Judaism, uh, and that it was all about the scepter. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that we need to we need the star and the scepter. Brilliant. Love it. Love it. Okay, well, we have a few minutes right now. Um, so I'm going to turn the podium over to our lovely Director of Communications, Sarah Leah Thompson, who will read the questions that have come in. Sarah Leah. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you so much, Emmanuel, for joining us and for sharing you. your insights about your book title. One of our viewers just let us know that they found it very drawing and it even brought, us, brought them to the Zoom. Um, <laughs> so the first question we have, um, oh, and to our audience as well, thank you for submitting all of your questions. We'll get through as many as we can. So the first question, will the demographic shifts in the US cause a shift in American-Israeli relations, in your opinion? So it's really hard to estimate those um, demographic uh, shifts uh, in the United States because these are really long-term tendencies. And of course, we have no control of demographic tendencies in the United States. What we do have control of is our policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the U.S. public opinion. And, and here, there's no doubt that it's a big challenge for Israel because uh, yes, we have our strongest allies today. We know where they are politically in the United States. Uh, we know that we have very strong allies with the evangelicals. Uh, but we also need to know that the United States is a very large and diverse country, and we need also to keep the dialogue uh, with, uh, with other segments of the U.S. population. Of course, that doesn't mean that we should try and, and, and make everybody happy. Uh, no, we cannot make everybody happy, especially people uh, who care more about the social status in certain neighborhoods of New York than about the well-being of the Jewish state. Uh, and not to give any names, but, you know, I mean, I will do it anyways, even though it's recorded. Uh, the article of Peter Beinhardt a year, a month ago, where he basically declared that he was no longer a Zionist, uh, ended up being a written interview for the New York Times because uh, he was given a job after that, writing a column for the New York Times. So we don't need to make those people happy because it's impossible. So it's impossible for Israel to really, um, uh, to really convince everybody and to keep a dialogue with everybody. But we should, we should keep our uh, support as broad as possible and as bipartisan as possible. It doesn't mean that everybody can be including in that tent. But it does also mean that we cannot put all our eggs in the same baskets because, you know, there are elections every four years, as we just uh, noticed, and uh, you never know what you're going to get. Thank you. The next question. 
is Israel capable of withstanding the upcoming pressure of a Biden administration to not make misguided concessions for supposed peace with BPA? So I, I don't think, I, I think it would be really suicidal for Joe Biden to invest his precious time and political capital in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I mean, that, that would be the, the, the most absurd thing for him to do. I mean, obviously, you know, this is the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the best way to ruin your presidency and waste your time. Uh, he just has to give a phone call to Bill Clinton and Barack Obama and, and ask them where he should spend his time and, and energy. Uh, his main priority right now is, I mean, obviously domestic with the COVID-19, that's obvious, but internationally it's going to be China and Iran. And he's going to pay lip service to uh, the Palestinians because he kind of has to. But I don't expect him uh, to uh, really seriously think that he's going to solve this uh, problem that has, uh, hasn't been solved by all the efforts of his predecessors. Uh, I think he knows enough of the Middle East and of this conflict uh, to make this mistake. So I don't expect, I mean, this is not, we're not going back to Obama in uh, 2009. Obama apparently really thought, mostly because of his Jewish advisors, that if you would just put pressure on Israel, then you would have this miracle and you would have peace in the Middle East. I mean, Biden obviously is, is older and wiser. I think so, and I hope so. And, and he has other priorities. So I, I really don't expect, I mean, I, I, I allow me to calm you down. I, I really don't expect Biden to give us a call in two months and say you have to free settlements and commit to uh, this and that territory. I, I really don't expect this to happen. And last, last point, yep. by the way, for, for him to do that, he would need to be dealing with an Israeli government, which we won't have for another man. For, and we, we, I mean, we, you know, we don't have a government anyway. So who is, going to, who is he going to pressure? Right, right. <laughs> Thank you. And the next question, uh, and on the note of Obama, how much influence do you think Obama has on the formation of the new Biden administration? Is he, in fact, machinating behind the scenes? I don't think so, because, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure Biden, uh, you know, asks for his opinion here and there. Uh, but he's his, he, he, he's his own person. He was elected president of the United States, not thanks to Obama. And, uh, and also, again, when you look at the people he's been appointing, you do have some uh, people from the Obama administration. Uh, and I, I'm, sure he, uh, I'm sure he speaks to Obama and asks his opinion here and there. But at the end of the day, he doesn't really owe him his job right now. And he was elected. And, and, and I don't think Obama is really, uh, you, know, you know, telling him what to do. Thank you. The next question. Um, what about China's interests in the Middle East? How do they stand in relation to Israeli interests? So China in the Middle East, China looks at the Middle East as a gas station, basically. Uh, for them, the Middle East is a gas station and uh, they'll do anything to get their oil and natural gas. Uh, they couldn't care less if Iran has a nuclear bomb as long as they get their gas and, uh, and their oil. And as long as they can build their military presence in Djibouti and the basis there gets bigger and bigger, uh, as long as they can build their Belt and Road Initiative to the Middle East. They do not like, by the way, this normalization between Israel and, uh, and the Arab states because it gives uh, advantage to the US, to the United States. Uh, it reinforces the United States in the region, and so they don't like it. Uh, their approach to Israel and to the Arab world and to the conflict is completely business-like. All they care about, as I said, is their energy supplies, is to have some kind of stability. They don't want wars in the region. Uh, and, um, and they're happy to see the United States go. Uh, so that's really their, their approach. So you have to understand also, they don't have some kind of uh, ideological approach to Israel, as opposed to Russia, which has this long history of anti-Semitism. The Chinese don't have that. They, they actually admire the Jews because they're saying the Jews are very smart. We like the Jews, but they, they're completely not sentimental. The Chinese are so not sentimental. It's all about business. It's all about their uh, power. And, uh, and so that's their approach to Israel and to the Middle East. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question, do you think that the Abraham Accords have the potential of pushing the Palestinians into real negotiations? 
Unfortunately, no, because nothing, nothing will bring them to negotiations and to compromise. So um, uh, I'm not optimistic on that because uh, uh, also, also don't forget that the, um, what is left of the Palestinian Authority is currently led by a man who's 85, who's a chain smoker and who was last elected in 2005 for four years and who's completely despised and hated uh, by uh, the uh, Palestinian population. So who is he going to negotiate with and about what? Uh, and, and, and the Gaza Strip is run by Hamas, so there's really nothing to negotiate. He has no interest in negotiating. I mean, the problem with Abbas is that he's been enjoying the best of two worlds for the past 15 years, where he gets all this money from foreign donors. He has his private jet who travels around the world complaining about Israel. So the status quo for him is ideal because he gets to complain about Israel. Uh, the, at the same time, he gets to visit whoever he wants around the world, uh, to talk at the UN, uh, to get his subsidized economy and spread money around his uh, allies and his family. Uh, so if it wasn't for his age and his health, he would be happy to continue uh, for another 20 years. And, and negotiating with Israel is just for him an excuse as he has proven in the past, to try and convince the United States that he wants a deal. And whenever he was offered one, he, he ran away. I mean, it was when Almert uh, offered him a deal in 2008, uh, he, he ran away. When, uh, when Kerry offered him an even better deal in 2014, he, he ran away because he has no uh, intention of solving this conflict. He wants it to keep on a low flame and, and keep the status quo, which, uh, which just works for him. So, so now with the uh, normalization with the Arab states, you know, he's, uh, he, he has, it, doesn't, it doesn't change his, uh, his incentive to, to prevent any agreement with Israel and to keep this, uh, this status quo. Uh, the question, the real question is, what will happen once he, he's no longer around? Because the, uh, the battle of his, of his succession is going to be very nasty. Um, you know, it's not going to be an issue of counting ballots and, uh, and voting through... Uh, uh, through the part, uh, through the uh, through the mail, you know, it's going to be who is going to kill whom and getting rid of whom. So it's going to be the real question is what is going to happen after Abbas? As long as he's around, nothing is going to happen. The, the big question, I don't have an answer to that, is what happens after him. And when we know, then we'll be able to estimate the chances of maybe seeing some kind of impact of the normalization on the Palestinian leadership. Thank you. We have time for a couple more questions. The next one we have, what options does Israel have in case Biden goes forward with a U.S. return to the JCPOA? First of all, just, uh, just today, the, uh, uh, the Iranian foreign minister uh, made those statements uh, basically telling the U.S., if you think you're just going to return to the JCPOA on your terms, so I expect him to have a very rough time with the Iranians. That's first of all. Uh, I mean, you know, and, and, and the JCPOA, uh, don't forget, was signed in 2015 for 10 years. We're now in 2020. So we're, in, we're halfway of these agreements, which has been violated right and left by the Iranians for the past two years. Uh, they're, uh, they've been enriching, uh, 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 you know, uh, at a very high sp uh, speed. So now they, they actually happen to be quite close to the bomb right now, which is why I don't think Biden has so much leverage. Uh, and, and, and as I said, uh, he, Biden cannot count on the Chinese and the Russians playing ball because the Chinese are just, the Chinese and the Russians just want the Biden administration to, uh, to, uh, to fail in its, in, its, in its attempts to renegotiate uh, with, uh, with the Iranians. So, um, you know, it's not, that, it's not that there is a risk or a possibility of the Iranians saying, oh, okay, sorry, we'll just go back to uh, two years ago, we'll disenrich what we've been enriching and we'll, uh, we'll behave again. It's not going to happen. So he's going to come with his demands. The Iranians are going to tell him to forget it. And then we'll see if, uh, if he really has any leverage. But as I said, he won't be able to count on the Chinese and on the Russians. And, uh, and except for sanctions, I don't really see what leverage you will have to, uh, uh, to convince the Iranians to negotiate a better deal. So I'm very Thank skeptical. You. 
<laughs> so for our last question, do you think that Israel and the Sunni states may go their own way without much coordination with the U.S. moving forward? Uh, again, sorry? The question is, do you think there's a chance that Israel and the various Sunni states that they've created uh, deals with or agreements with may go their own way without much coordination from the U.S.? I don't think so because I mean I, I think that with the with Bahrain and the UAE, uh, you know, they will continue. We will continue this uh, normalization. The big question mark, of course, is with regard to Sudan and Saudi Arabia. So with Sudan, I don't expect uh, any progress in the coming months because the deal basically between Sudan and the Trump administration uh, was that they would be taken out of the list of uh, terror supporting countries. And I don't think that Biden is going to be as forgiving to them as Trump was willing to be. So I don't think, uh, you know, with Sudan, we should expect much. Uh, and with Saudi Arabia, again, the, the problem with Saudi Arabia is that they want to see what's going to happen between Biden and the Iranians. Like, they're not going to make any move until they find out what is the story was the uh, negotiation between the U.S. Uh, and Iran. And of course, uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia, you have this... Uh, generation struggle between the king and, and MBS. MBS would be happy to just go ahead, but the king is still from the old generation. Like he's still stuck to the mantra, of, I cannot move ahead without something on the Palestinians, which of course MBS, uh, you know, he couldn't care less. But uh, so you have this generation struggle between the king and MBS, you have, uh, and, and mostly, as I said, the Saudis will wait and see what's happening between the uh, Biden administration uh, and Iran. Great. So final Sarah. question? Okay. Uh, I think that's all we have time for, yeah. That's all we have time. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. You've got uh, this incredible breadth as well as depth of knowledge. And um, it's this is fascinating. I myself am going to order the book, The Star, the Thank Star. You. Right away. It's, it's, it's I, on I Amazon. encourage everybody, uh, everybody to please, please order it. It's, it seems like a really gripping read. Um, and speaking about authors, um, next Tuesday at 12 noon, we're going to have Tevi Troy, who just wrote a really um, interesting book again called Fight House. Um, and it's, um, he was on in the inside of the George W. Bush White House, and he sees that no White House, I think this is without um, inner disputes, and he's going to um, talk a lot about that and also about different personalities and what their attitudes towards Israel were while they were serving in the White House. So that should be um, also extremely interesting. And I want to thank Emmanuel, and I also have to tell yeah. people that um, even though Giving Tuesday is over, we still can use your support. All of this costs us a lot of money, and we really believe that a well-informed, educated public can affect good policy. And um, aside from these webinars, we've had two this week. We've had many, many webinars. I think it's like 45 since the pandemic began. Um, and we, um, you know, we're on Capitol Hill every day, not physically, but um, because of the pandemic, but via conference call and um, webinar, and we're fighting the good fight for all of you and for all of us that really needs to see a strong, secure Israel and a strong, secure United States of America. Anyway, thank you again, Emmanuel. It was really Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, and I can't wait to read the book. <laughs> thank you.